How is everybody? Good. Good. Man, the weather was getting nice, and then it just all of a sudden wasn't as nice because this terrible winter that we experience here <laughs> in Los Gatos. So, yeah, man, it's good. It's a good sign. I look forward to Sundays. It just is. And um, I look forward to this day for so many reasons, not just because maybe what you think, well, Dale likes to talk or whatever else. I look forward because I'm hearing stories already in the past few weeks, and I, I'm not saying it just started. I just get to hear them of what God's doing in your lives and what God's even doing in your heart during our time together. And I look forward to meeting God with you all on a, on a weekly basis. And it's not because of like, wow, here's such a great sermon that I met God. It's just an openness in this posture of receiving from God and a posture of what he has to say. That's what I look forward to. Um, if you know me, which most of you know me, some of you were just getting to know each other, we haven't met yet, stories are really, really important to me. They start out as just events in my life or all of our lives, and then because I do what I do, I, I find stories that connect to deeper truths because they're fun to tell in a sermon. But then some of them permeate to a point where it actually becomes like a life mantra. Like this is, this goes bigger than that. So I love stories. I love hearing stories. I love watching a good story. My wife and I watched the movie Coda last night. If you need a really good story, man, that is a powerful, powerful story. And I'm just like at the end just bawling. I'm like, okay, this is just unfair at this point. I go, that was a bit rough. But I love stories. And there's a story that many of you have heard, and, and, and what's going to never will happen. I run out of stories, so I retread some of them. And some of you are like, oh, I've heard this one before. My point in them all is to connect us to something deeper. But there's a story that happened uh, to me and to my daughter that became, I didn't even realize it at the time, when I was able to connect it to some deeper things, it has been so helpful. She was young, I don't know, three or four years old. We were in Hawaii, we were at the ocean. Um, my wife was on the beach. I, I asked my daughter if she wanted to come out and play in the water. And she's like, sure, because, you know, when you're with your dad, what could happen? She learned in life that I'm with my dad, anything could happen. And we'll see what happens. So we're going out a little further. It's just white water. Um, and then inevitably, my wife yells from the shore, not too far. And I'm like, she's with her dad. There's nothing that can happen bad. So we kept walking out, and we're playing and having an amazing time. If you spent much time in the ocean, you know that every once in a while, chances are, there might be a sneaker wave that comes. And it's a wave that is significantly larger than anything you had seen that day. It seems a little unfair, but it's what happens. I was with her. And all of a sudden, this wave swelled up, and it was significantly larger. I mean, now I like to tell it, like, it was 50 feet tall. It may have been, like, three feet tall, but it felt like 50 feet. No, it was over our heads. And we hit that point where either we had a choice to make. Now, some of you may say, why don't you just run out of the ocean? Because it was one of those waves that was sucking all the water towards it that if we turn it, we're running against the tide. That wasn't an option. And what I quickly realized, where we were standing was the crash zone. We had another option. We're just going to stand here and take it. My daughter was four. She wasn't a big fan of taking it. So in that moment, a good, good father grabs his daughter and starts to sprint at the wave. My daughter freaks. She's kicking me. She's convinced I am the meanest father in the world. She's like, Dad, what are you doing? She's pinching me. She's grabbing me. She got a hold of my ear and thought if she squeezed harder, I would stop. But I'm like, there's no turning back now. We run towards this wave. She was convinced I was just antagonizing her. I was persecuting her. She's screaming. We're running. And I said, when I count to three, hold your breath. We're going under, which made no sense to her. We, hit, we get to the wave. I'm like, we're going under. Hold your breath. She did not. <laughs> to my defense, I prepared her. At least I gave her the instructions beforehand. We dove under. She came up. She's coughing. And Lisa's like, what are you doing? And my response to every time Lisa asks me that, I say, nothing happening here. 
Just go out. We're on the other side. My daughter's coughing, and she's like, Dad, I hate you. And I'm like, I know. She likes me now. We made it. I'm like, babe, I know. But if we stayed in that spot, that wave would have crushed her. She didn't believe me. She wasn't like, oh, thanks, God, Dale. God. Woo, that's a little bit of a complex. <laughs> I got to bring that up with my therapist this week. <laughs> you have to know, most of the time, I'm just entertaining myself, just so you know that. <laughs> Dear Lord, Lisa, write that down. Another issue that I have. <laughs> my daughter did not thank me in that moment. She was mad. She didn't understand. We went back to the shore. And I tried to explain to her the waves. And I'm like, babe, the easiest thing I can say to you is sometimes there's a wave coming at you and there's life on the other side of it. And the only way you're going to experience life on the other side of something that seems too big, something that just seems like we've got to run, is that there are times you have to run right at that to experience life on the other side of it. And that became such an important thing for me to remember in so many areas of my life. The next morning, I'm like, hey, Anna, you want to go out in the water? She's like, no, I do not. It took her a while, and that's okay. But for me, it permeated in the fact that no matter how big something looks, it's not just worth just standing and letting it hit you. It's not just inevitable. There's life on the other side of things. We've been going line by line, verse by verse, into this mantra through Philippians chapter 2, this creed. Let me read it to you. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That was a few weeks ago. Who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Let's pray for it. Father, we join you in heaven. You invite us to come boldly before you. We sing, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Help us to understand something new and fresh. Speak to us. May we hear you. We've come separately in cars or bikes or however we got here. We joined together to sing, and now we engage with you. Help us not to leave the same. In your name, amen. Last week, we looked at this verse, and we looked at the, what the meaning of these words were. And it says that Jesus was the nature of God. And we looked at the Greek word that he was, it describes him as morphetheo, his very essence his very nature, everything about him was God. Morphetheo. Then Paul follows it up with the next line that says he was also, but he chose to become morphetheo, which means fully human, the essence of a human. He didn't give one away and become the other. He chose to become both. And what he chose to do was allow his deity to be concealed for a while. People didn't know that he was God. But he allowed, after considering the options, after considering what needed to be done, he chose to change for our behalf. And that change and that choosing says, have this kind of mindset that chooses to do that. His essence was fully God and fully human. His deity was now within this creative body. To me, I see no greater example of trust. For Jesus to say, I'm letting go of this, to take on the form of a human, to, to conceal it, to now be in a form of a baby, and to grow within that. Jesus had to place himself that he was trusting his father. And if you look at the life of Jesus, I wonder what he was trusting him for. There are times it's really, really easy for us to start trusting for God for things. 
Was Jesus trusting God for his father for like a good life? Was he trusting, you know, for lots of stuff? Was he trusting his father to be blessed with stuff by being obedient and obeying the rules? If that is true, he did the human life really, really bad. Because actually what Jesus experienced was rejection from his family, disbelief from his hometown, accusations that he was literally the devil, or at least there were demons inside of him, that people were plotting to kill him, that his closest friends actually fell asleep during his most troubled times, and that he felt a level of anxiety so high that he literally sweat blood. So what was he trusting his father for? And could God actually be trusted that? Was Jesus doing this human thing wrong? You know, that actually seems improbable. But as a human, what was he trusting God actually for? I think what we're trusting God for becomes so key. Because what I have found to be true is that one of the biggest reasons people begin to deconstruct their faith which means to tear apart the things they believe or they become indifferent to God is because the foundation of what they believe about God or what they trust him for are things he has never promised. We are counting on God. Now, I know full well I might be misunderstood today. I'm okay with that because I'm going to probe a little bit because I also see the outcome of so many people who grow up or attended church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, become disappointed by something in life and start to say, the God I was counting on did not come through. So I'm asking you, what are you counting on God for? And did God actually promise that? Because it's quite possible we're counting on a God that we've constructed in our own heads a loving God does this. A good father does this. God wants me to be happy, so therefore this, this, and this probably should happen. Here's an incredibly simplistic example. You know that idea of a trust fall? There's like a team building thing. You're standing there, and the idea is that people are behind you. You cannot see them, so you may close your eyes. Sometimes they put a blindfold on you, and you fall past the point of no return and just trust that people are going to catch you. The trust fall. Let's say you were at work that day, and they did one of these. You go home, and you're talking about it with your family. We did this trust fall, and your little child, maybe three or four years old, is like, what's a trust fall? Well, you know, like you stand there and you fall and then people just catch you. And so the child goes, oh, I want to try the trust fall. But he doesn't really listen to the instructions. You tell them, you need to fall back and I will catch you. The child's like, all he hears is, when I fall, my dad will catch me. So the father gets behind him, the kid closes his eyes, but instead of falling back, the kid goes, I'm going to go forward. <laughs> Boom. The kid gets up. He's like, where were you, dad? You said, when I fall, you will catch me. The father's like, no. I said, fall back. And then the argument comes about fall back and fall forward. And then the wife comes over and is like, what are you doing to our child? It's his fault. He's three. How could it be that? Once again, therapy time. Okay. <laughs> the point is this. In a simplistic way. That child just did what he thought. When I fall, my dad will catch me. And the dad was like, I was in position to catch you, but you just kind of did your own thing. Did you listen to the instruction? Now, what I don't want you to go is there's a secret pathway of trusting God. What I want you to hear is, am I counting on something that God promised he actually would do? Let me show you something. It might help you understand one of the things that God has actually promised us. Let me go back to these verses. Let me read them again and let me unpack it a little bit. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, bearing in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Paul clarifies something. He was made 
in human likeness. Now, let me pull you back to the beginning. Not the beginning of the sermon, but the beginning of time. Because if we understand, if we misunderstand how God initially started everything, we'll be off. Even if you're just one degree off at the beginning, after a while you become more off and off. Let me read you from Genesis, Genesis 1.26. We're going to unpack this a little bit. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Let us make man in our likeness. Paul says Jesus took on the form of human likeness. We're going to bring that together a little bit. So at the very beginning, it is so important. The beginning wasn't just something that went awry. The beginning was something that actually happened. And it is God drawing us back to the garden. It is God drawing us back to intimacy with him. You see, man was created to be as much like God as any creature that was created. More than any creature that was created. God gave man and woman, God gave us intellect and emotions and will. And he created a body with what we call senses to be able to see and smell and taste and hear, and feel. He gave humanity a physical life that was under the control of our mental, emotional, and volitional powers. But then God gave us something that set us apart from animal creation. He gave us a soul. He gave us spirit. You see, man's body was, um, made him world conscious, enabled us to live in the physical environment made us be able to like interact and and do things in the physical world. And our soul made us self-conscious or conscious of ourselves, meaning that we were aware of that we were distinct individuals with distinct attributes, with a distinct nature, personality, potential, responsibilities, accountability. And then God gave us a spirit. And the spirit It makes us God conscious. There's something bigger than us. There's something broader than us. And this made us aware that he existed to worship and serve his creator. So he created man with body, soul, and spirit. And the result is the Holy Holy Spirit indwelt this human spirit. He was a creation not just created by God, but inhabited by God that God and humans were intimate and together. When he created animals, he, he each gave each one of them like a, something like an instinct so that they would behave as they should behave. Dogs behave like dogs. Eagles behave like eagles. Fish behave like fish. There's an instinct of how to live, but it's very clear that man was not created to just live by instinct, to just by gut level but to be literally inhabited by God. He created man to be inhabited by himself, that he would be the source code of our behavior. This meant man behaved as God would behave. That kind of blows our mind that that's how the original creation was. It was a human, but sin had not entered the world yet. And there was an intimacy There was an unashamedness. And true to man's body, his soul and spirit, but there were options and there were choices. And because of those options and choices, we could be challenged by the phrase, did God really say that, Adam and Eve? Did God really say that? Maybe you're trusting in something he didn't actually say. I go back to that to help us all understand what this means to be made in the likeness of men, though. We see the beginning of time that God created man to be inhabited by God, but now we have Jesus choosing to trust his Father by becoming in the likeness of men. Jesus was made in the likeness of men as that he became truly human. Here's the key. He was, and when we look at the life of Jesus... 
He was as God intended man to be from the beginning. His spirit was always ruled by the Holy Spirit. Christ's intellect, his emotions, his will, his nature, his person, his personality, his senses and physical powers were all under the control of the Holy Spirit as a human being, moment by moment, day by day, year by year. From the time he drew his first breath until that last moment when his spirit left him, he was controlled by the spirit. So think about that. A perfect, obedient, trusting intimacy with God. But even that did everything right, right? All the steps, led by the Spirit, directed by God. Even that, who was in a human essence, Jesus, in complete intimacy with God, even him experienced deep struggles and deep inner pain and deep grief and loss and disappointment. It's quite possible that he experienced disappointment that God's plan included all of those things. And yet, he trusted his father. I think it asks, begs us to ask the question, so what was he actually trusting his father for? Because we love to say, if I do this, this, and this, God, I get this. Even if we don't say it, instinctively we believe it. And we become disappointed. There's a few things I want to, it's just vital for us to understand. The first one is this, is around belief and faith. And because there are patterns of belief, they actually can betray our faith. See, belief and faith are not the same thing. Beliefs are our theology. It's the things that we think about God. Most of them, hopefully, come from the actual source of Scripture. Here are the things to believe about God. But also what happens to our belief is we add things about what we think God should be doing, who he is. Sometimes it's quite innocently. We just take on other ideas that other people have had. God should do this. We hear this in conversations all the time. Well, God wants me to be happy, so therefore, this is what God wants from me. And that's how our beliefs start to grow. And then we place our faith on top of that belief. So what happens is if some of those beliefs don't come through, if God doesn't actually show himself like we want him to show himself, or the timing, let's be honest, that's probably most of it, is the timing that we think he should come through, especially in an environment where timing and patience is not a virtue or a value. In fact, we actually embrace the timeliness of things. And when God acts counter to timeliness, it shakes our beliefs because we have connected God to be a good father and good fathers do what I want when I want. No, they don't. There's something bigger. In A.J. Svoboda's book, After Doubt, which has been a life-changing book for me to read, he writes this. Faith is a relationship of trust between persons. To have, faith, uh, to have faith is not merely an idea about God. It's to have trust in God himself as a person. We have our beliefs about who God is and our hearts place faith in who we know God to be. The two work together. One problem is when we begin placing faith in our ideas about God over God himself. Our ideas about him versus actually who he is. It's the same, maybe you're growing up and you have ideas around who your father is and who he is, and then you discover some of the truths about some of his own brokenness. What you do with that. Because there's something significantly different about trusting someone and trusting someone for something. You may have the same kind of example. I invite you to think about someone you've known for a long time and you just trust them. You trust them that they have your best in mind. You trust them that when the chips are down, they are there for you. It's the wedding vows, if you will. 
in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer. And if you're not married, it's those kind of vows. A good friend should do X, Y, and Z. You just trust them. I trust my wife implicitly. I know after 32 years of marriage of ups and downs and pain and joy that she has my best in mind. I just trust her for that. But if there's a time I say, hey, can you pick me something up from the store? And let's say the busyness of her day caused her to forget. She comes home and I'm like, hey, did you pick this thing up for me? And she's like, oh, I forgot. The mature response would be like, I understand it's not a thing. The immature response would be like, can I even trust you for anything? I'm having a crisis of trust right now. Like, I know you care the best for me, but you forgot to pick up half and half. Who are you anyways? That's comical for some. Not for my wife right now, because she's like, I'm sorry. That's not a real event. But that same kind of mindset can happen with God. There's a significant difference of building our faith, our, our relationship on God, believing in someone versus just the things he provides. Back to us and God. It's possible that we start trusting God to do the things he never said he would do. Maybe it's an assumption of how things should be or could be or what other people seem to be getting. Maybe some of this kind of pushes people to act in such a way that we can start to leverage things from him. Others might drift into a kind of a complacent indifference about him and just rely on God like a great warranty on an appliance. So at least please listen to this part really clearly because this would be a huge misquote if you don't. God cannot be trusted to keep, all, to keep us from all harm, difficulty, and the darkness that life can bring. Some of that, the first part of that statement, some of you just went, that, what, have you ever heard the phrase, God cannot be trusted? What I am saying is this. If God so chooses to keep you from all harm, all disappointment, he certainly can and has more than enough power to do that. And he might. But he never promised that he would. So when we go all in and say, God, I am trusting you that this bad stuff never happens to me, you're going all in on something was never promised. God says, I never said that. God didn't prevent that, uh, those kinds of experiences from his own son in the flesh. He's not gonna do that for us. But he can be trusted to do what he said he would do. I have discovered that we really realize what we think about God when we face it, when that wave is coming, when it's like, it's go or no go. Those of you who know me know that 12 years ago, I got a phone call from a doctor after many years of tests. I was checking out at Costco. He didn't know I was at Costco, but I was at Costco, and I pick up the phone, and he said, Mr. Gustafson, you have multiple sclerosis. And my mindset was like, don't you know I'm at Costco? He didn't know I was at Costco. I'm the one who picked up the phone. But that day was a worse day. I remember sitting with my wife a little bit and telling her, and I could think in my head of all the other people that deserved this more than me. None of your names came to mind. Don't worry about that. <laughs> it was a really bad day. Because we trust certain things about God, even if we don't realize it. I had this thing within me that I trusted my body that he created would keep going as long as my body needed to go. I didn't even realize I had this cause and effect belief in him. But it got to a point where I would say to God, don't you know what, I, what we have going here? I have been so faithful for so long and now it's over. And now it's just done. 
I started to realize I had to if then. If I do this, then I get this, and I never realized it. I never realized it until the difficult times came. So is it possible that God's like, I'm going to allow this excruciating time to come because the direction you are on with me right now will not go well with you? That was a rough couple of years, first couple of years. I remember screaming at God. I think I said to him, how dare you do this to us? I kept saying us. I thought that was more powerful. And some people debate this with me. I don't care. I literally heard the voice of God. And he said to me, does your condition change anything about what my son did, that he came and died and he rose again? Does it change anything about that? I'm like, no. Really mature for whatever, however well that was. It doesn't change it. So what do you want to do? What can you do? It was in those moments where I'm like, brokenness is a reality. Hurt is a reality. But it doesn't change anything that Jesus came to do. It didn't change anything that God was present with me and enduring with me. I have seen that this broken world can affect my body. But what I realized, it cannot touch the soul and the spirit that God gave us. And that's his best work. When I fail to take into account the longer version of God for my life and only think short term, it's those moments that the pain and difficulty and disappointment become much larger than they really need to be. This becomes increasingly worse when they happen to those we love, don't they? When really tough things happen to our kids, isn't that, with those who had, but that's one of the hardest things. Like, I'll, I'll take this one on behalf of my kid. I'll do anything for that. And there's a temptation to even protect our kids from all things and no hurt and no tra- challenge. And, and we even say things to our kids that we mean so well. We're like, don't worry, don't worry. God will never disappoint you. And then your child goes on and they get disappointed. What do they do with that? They're like, I've been told that God never disappoints me. And now I feel disappointed. It's potentially we've added something to their belief about God that they push their faith on that God's never said to them. This may sound hard. I've been incredibly disappointed by God. Not God in himself, but I was disappointed by God's plan for my life in that moment. But what do we do with that? How do we press forward in that? How do we declare that those moments are hard and that we don't pass things on to people's faith that are unhelpful? See, it's God's desire that we move from a secondhand faith to a firsthand faith. Jesus trusted in his his father's larger plan for God's enduring presence. Jesus went from fully God and fully human because he trusted his father that the reconciling end would be its best result. And he trusted God for his enduring presence in his life. And he trusted God for the promise of his presence and his power. This is moving from a second-hand faith to a first-hand faith. Trusting God for the right things. One of the most beautiful things, and we're zeroing in here from the book of Psalms, is that we see the brutal honesty of its authors and in their intimacy and how they related to God. And we see that in in their innermost pain, they do this thing where they stop, they pause, and then they declare something. In the beginning of Psalm 22, it gives us some extra words for maybe our time of response in a few minutes. Listen to Psalm 22 and the words of David, and then he stops and declares. Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer me. By night, I find no rest. And he stops and he says, yet... You are enthroned as the Holy One. 
You're the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. And then he goes right back into what's right in front of him. But I am a worm. I am not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Stops. And he says the word, yet. Even though these things are happening, yet. Yet, God, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even at my mother's breast, from birth I was cast on you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. So do not be far from me. For trouble is near and there is no one to help. For all of us, there is an incredible power of yet. What I am experiencing right now is so hard yet. This doesn't change that Jesus did not regard equality with God as something to held on to, but he took the very nature of a servant and humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross for me. It's those power of yet to embrace, to go, this is what I can trust my father for, even when all hell is breaking down around me. What can you trust God for? You can trust God for the yet. To stop, to pause. The power of yet pulls us out of our current spinning and experiences and reconnects us to his reality, his truth. This is what I'm experiencing, yet you have me, God. That's what you can trust God for. The things that matter to God are in, in the exact prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. You know these words. What matters to God? What can you trust God for? Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said, our Father, who's in heaven, you can trust me that I am there. Hallowed be your name, that he is holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You can trust that God's way will come will make things right. Give us today our daily bread. God cares about what's in front of you today. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. God cares about your relationships. He cares about the things that are separating you and he wants to make them right. And he lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You see, God is with us and as followers of Jesus, he is in us, just like the beginning in the garden. As God created man to be, we are now with the spirit in us. We are in that, in the midst of a broken, sinful world. He engages with us because he is kind and loving father. He gives us the bread and he clears the path ahead of us. He cares about our relationships and the temptations we face. He helps us close the gaps in our differences with each other and separate us from the sin that clings to you. He is doing this all the time. He loves and blesses his children with the desires of their heart. And yet, when the desires of our heart become the thing that we worship, he separates that from us. Because so many times we go, God, just bless me with this. And he says, I want to bless you. And that becomes our adoration. And he goes, that's not going to happen. God promised us restoration, his renewal and reconciliation, and he wants to do that with you.